I stood in the same lot where I had stood yesterday. The blood of the slaver executed by Stern still stained the ground. All around me, other slaves had gathered, pressing close. The rooftops around us were lined with griffins in talon armor. Stern took her favorite spot and stared out over us. Her anti-machine rifle was slung to her back, but I remembered the speed of her draw. The speakers fell silent, March of the Paris Brights cutting off mid-song. A couple of the ponies beside me whined nervously. I spotted blood and death in the crowd. Blood looked bored, inspecting your hoof. Daff looked grim. And then, I finally saw him. Red Eye. Flanked by an escort of alicorns, the pony whom I had come to blame for the great deal of the equestrian wasteland's wrongness, walked up from a ramp on the right side of the building where Stern was perched. Red Eye was a strong, able-bodied earth stallion with a crimson coat and a few light scars around a blank flank where his cutie mark should have been. He had a jet black mane and tail which were practically groomed, and he wore a black cape that was slung to droop off his right side. I could see only the left side of his body, clearly, as he strode towards the center of the roof, but his left eye was distinctly blue. I wasn't sure what I had been expecting. Hell, I think I had some expectation of an alicorn monster the size of a Pinkie Pie balloon, twisted and evil, radiating explosive power, or something equally as absurd. Red Eye was just a pony. I could end this all now. I just needed something big and heavy. I could float it over his head and drop it. Even if the griffin spotted me, even if Stern gunned me down, I could accept that just so long as I could take him with me. One of the alicorns looked out over the crowd, her eyes quickly finding me. She spread her wings and took to the air, keeping a protective watch. Damn it. They remembered, and they weren't going to let me pull the same trick twice. I realized with a chill that the alicorns knew I was here. So did their goddess. Which, I suspected, meant Red Eye did too. This was a stupid plan. In the middle of the roof, there was a strip of railing which had once held a sign. Red Eye trod up to it and the other two alicorns took their positions on either side of him. He turned towards us, putting his four hooves up spread out on the railing as he stared down. I gasped. My world suddenly lurched out from under my hooves. Workers! Welcome, and thank you for joining me. Red Eye was even more charismatic in person, his words oily smooth and devilishly persuasive but I was barely hearing him. My gaze was transfixed on the red glow that came out of the metal sheath around what should have been his right eye socket. A cyber pony? Red eye was a cyber pony? I was staring in the face of a level of technological advancement that soared way beyond terminals and sprite bots. Red eye had cybernetic implants. How? Where did he get them? When that sort of technology, when did that even come possible? My gaze traveled down his body, searching for other signs of augmentation, and locked onto his right foreleg. Red Eye was wearing a pit buck. Red Eye was a stable dweller. I have demanded a lot from you in the name of the future, Red Eye was saying as I shook myself out of my utter stupor. The crimson cyber augmented stallion even wore his pit buck on his right foreleg, which was uncommon, just like me. But I do not call for anything from you that I would not demand from myself, Red Eye claimed, looking out over us. The red beam of the eye flashed as it swept over me. As you can see, I was gifted, though through no merit of my own, with a privileged upbringing that the good ponies of our equestrian wasteland could only dream of. 
I lived in a stable where such luxuries existed, such as safety, food, and clean water, where they were taken for granted. Our water talisman alone could have given life-sustaining nourishment to thousands, but instead was being used for frivolous joys like our atrium's fountain. He frowned, shaking his head. Observe my eye. My stable offered medical and technological advancements far in excess of even pre-war civilization. Ponies in the highest ranks of stable tech com conspired to make my stable an experiment in rulership through the Earth Pony Way. Celestia, suckle me. Stable 2 had always known a unicorn overmare. I tried to imagine a stable under Earth Pony rule, and driven by the same push for progress and industry that had dominated the thinking of the Ministry of Technology. What could they accomplish over 200 years of isolation? Well, cybernetic implants, for one. I realized I had lost track of Red Eye's speech and chided myself for not paying closer attention now that he was actually right in front of me. But I couldn't help the oozing sense that I was looking into a dark and supremely fucked up mirror. Saw the equestrian wasteland for what it was. But more than that, I saw what it should be, and what it could be again. That night, for the first time, the goddess whispered to me. I found myself resisting a face hoof. The idea that the Alicorn's goddess was speaking to Red Eye, or at least that he could be under that impression, made a lot of sense. I knew a pony in Stable 2 who would sometimes pick up the stable's broadcast through metalwork in his jaw. Celestia only knew what all that wetware in Red Eye's head was capable of receiving, by intentional design or otherwise. The goddess communicated telepathically with the alicorns. Was she communicating with him too? Or was he just picking up stray signals? Preacher had suggested to Velvet Remedy that Red Eye was getting garbled messages. And the first thing that she showed me was how wrong my stable's teachings were. How actually repulsive our beliefs in Earth Pony supremacy. No breed of pony is greater than another. We are all slaves to the equestrian wasteland, and it is only through our work that we can be free. As what I had talked, I remember the twisted versions of stories and history I had seen in Stable 24. Even the tale of the Mare and the Moon, the tale of Princess Luna's thousand year fall into madness as Nightmare Moon. A madness she had been rescued to from by the group of friends who Luna had subsequently chosen to be the Ministry's mares, had been altered into the tales of a fallen prince. I could only guess that this is what Stable Tech had done to ensure a male-dominated experiment in the stable, what the teachings in Red Eye's stable would have been. But that work is worthless unless it is shared. Until we are all free, none of us are truly free, nor do we deserve to be. Red Eye glanced away, looking strangely ashamed. Then, with a fierceness I hadn't expected, he told us, and that is why my stable was the first to be dismantled. Its doors and supports torn out and melted down, its concrete walls and floors cut apart to make the foundation stones of the new cathedral. The fortress we are building on the site of my former home. To be our new capital, for the new Equestria, and the new home of our living goddess. I reeled. The ponies of my home were the first to join the army of the Children of Unity. Or, in the case of many, they became the first workers in these very yards where you work today. I saw the bounty of our stables shared, the water talisman giving to struggle in towns which now knows the joy of clean and pure water. I focused the great minds of our best science ponies towards the task of the coming new age. The only thing that remains of my home is the cloak I wear as a reminder. 
Red Eye claimed, smiling down at us. Everything I have ever had, I have given, as you do today. His eyes, both mechanical and natural, looked over the ponies in the crowd. His voice was paternal, and I could not be prouder of all of you. He glanced back to Stern. The black-colored griffin nodded her white-feathered head, but her beak twisted into a scowl of dislike the moment he turned away. The alicorn in the air continued to circle, keeping her eyes out for unidentified floating objects. Looking to us again, bathing us in a smile beneath the slate-covered clouds, Red Eye continued and announced, And so I come bringing the gift of respite. Tomorrow shall be a day of rest. None shall labor. Furthermore, the bounty of the Romer Bar still will be made freely available to you, for those who wish to taste the finest horse whiskey Philadelphia has to offer. The words of the leader of our slavers was met with clopping applause and shouts of joys. It was insanity. The gratitude of the crowd made as much sense as our oatmeal. I looked around and found a few ponies who were not celebrating. One of them was Daff, although blood seemed to be cheering for the both of them. Red Eye kindly grinned and then waved a hoof for quiet. The roars and stomping died away easily, if not strangled. <laughs> and I have also arranged for entertainment. Two full events in the pit with seating for every pony to enjoy. He looked down over us. That is, of course, if I can get some volunteers. The quiet, the quiet became a hard silence. The slave ponies looked to one another. And we have won, Red Eye announced as he looked into the crowd. Any more? I looked around to see which pony had volunteered for the blood sport. Daff was holding up a hoof. Blood was staring at him in shock. Then, slowly, in a show of companionship that I thought beyond the vicious ex raider mare, Blood stood next to the piss-colored stallion and raised her own hoof, lowering her head to sigh. Fuck you, Daffodil, she muttered. I hate you so much. Red Eye's voice counted out. That's two! Everything went to hell about an hour after Red Eye's speech. I was making my way back towards the bumper plow structure when a mare's scream jolted me into a run. The scream was coming from inside a building whose decaying paint job proclaimed Philadelphia Fun Farm Mirror Maze and House of Wacky Reflections. The mare screamed again and I charged inside. The interior of the building was dark and dusty the air filled with moats, and the floor covered in shattered glass. I levitated myself a little as I moved, not wanting to cut my hooves. This place was a maze, just as advertised, but only a few of the mirror frames held anything more than a few nasty shards jutting against their backboards. Old graffiti suggested that a raider band had once used this place for fun of their own design. No! Get off me! The mare cried out, and I skidded to a stop as I recognized the voice. It was blood. I heard laughter, and a buck's voice, husky and cruel. Now, why shouldn't you have some fun tonight? It's only right, seeing that you're going to die in the pit tomorrow. I heard a grunt that sounded like daff, and then a sound of wood impacting pony flesh. I trotted forward until I caught a scene reflecting in the remaining third of a tattered mirror. Two slave master ponies had blood pressed against a wall. I could see blood flowing from her back, where the jagged fragments of a mirror behind her were cutting into her tail and flank. One of the slaves, our slavers, was a unicorn, and he was floating a lever-action shotgun at blood's face, as he pressed lewdly against her. The buck next to him covered her with a sawn-off shotgun, almost identical to the first firearm I had ever seen. 
Three more slavers were piled on Daff. One, a mare, was trying to beat him into submission with the butt of her rifle. My heart flared with rage. I felt my nerves ignite. A pony in my head tried to remind me that I couldn't start killing slavers. That my only chance to get red eye required keeping a low profile until I could get close. That I still had a lot of work to do. That I really didn't want to save the sadistic bitch and her rapist buck friend anyway. What the hell was I doing, risking my life, risking everything, for them? Absolutely none of that mattered, as the slavers learned when the glare from my horn was matched by the light that flooded over hundreds of deadly sharp shards of mirrored glass. The slaver pony with the sawn-off shotgun managed to get off a shot before the room became a chisenart. He missed. The particular bloody murder of five slavers was not going unnoticed. One shot fired had drawn attention, and now I was running through the maze, trying desperately to figure my way out while uh, slaver guards and heavy barding and battle saddles gave chase. I'd left Daft and Blood alive and in shock. The corridor decorated with a scene so bloody it would have made raiders envious. I'd snatched up the lever action shotgun and the mayor's rifle, but hadn't had time to search the remains. I only had the ammo currently in the firearms. According to my eyes forward sparkle, that wasn't much. Two shots in the shotgun, twelve in the rifle. Red marks on my EFS compass told me that two more guards were ahead of me. They undoubtedly had the building surrounded outside. My only hope was to get out of here and change the terrain before there was enough time for the closest slave forces to be brought to bear. I'd wished I'd chosen to bring the stealth buck after all. The red marks moved, weaving through the maze, drawing closer. I crouched down, hiding, shotgun ready. The moment the first guard's head appeared in the corridor, I slid into sats and opened fire. The slaver guard went down hard, bleeding from a hole torn in her throat. The second was right behind her. I put the other shot I had into her face, centered on her left eye. But I discarded the lever action shotgun and galloped ahead. I heard shouts and the galloping sounds of armored shod hooves on shattered glass behind me. Ahead, I spotted an open doorway, twilight pouring in around the slaver pony positioned there. She was a unicorn and was floating a riot shield in front of her as she finished setting up a chain gun at the en entrance. Fuck. I dove into another passage and back towards a dead end as I weighed my options. The slavers behind me were getting closer. I bumped into a mirror behind me, a splash of cold washing over my body from the touch. I turned, looking into the only fully intact mirror in the house of wacky reflections, and froze. Staring back at me was me, but not me. The little pip staring back at me was wearing cobbled together raider armor. She was shot to hell dying, her body given out as she glared at me in a swiftly deteriorating battle stance, her gaze daring me to make another move. I shrank back in horror, turned, and ran, right into the path of the chain gun. I would have been, a bl been bloody giblets if my sudden appearance hadn't completely surprised the unicorn mare. The moment it took her to recover was just enough for me to telekinetically grab the gun and spin it around opening fire. The riot shield was sorely insignificant to its rather awesome firepower. I paused a moment in a futile attempt to pull the chain gun off its mounting and take it with me, then dashed out the door. A sniper in one of the pinky pie balloons took a shot. The bullet was past me, tearing into a ruined popcorn cart. I started weaving, making myself as difficult a target as possible. I needed someplace safe. Preferably someplace high. It was time to call Calamity. This whole plan was a bust. A griffin swooped in overhead, stifling me with a submachine gun. I changed course, 
hoping I was being corralled. I was. The path in front of me was dead-ended at the wrought iron fence that surrounded the amusement park. They had maneuvered me into a trap. At least, that was their intention. As I galloped past an overturned confectionery stand, Pinkie Pie's Pink Pies, I ma magically scooped up a dozen scattered pie tins, floating them ahead of me. I levitated them each higher than the last, forming stepping stairs. Wrapping myself within a levitation field to virtually negate my own weight, I ran up the stairway of pie tins and leapt over the fence. The Pinkie Pie Balloon Sniper fired again, putting a hole through the very last tin, just as my hoof left it. The griffin turned and continued the chase, but for at least a moment, I had reduced my opponents to two. I dove, rolling, and brought up my targeting spell, unleashing half the bullets from the rifle into the griffin's armored underbelly as she flew over me. Talon armor turned out not to be very good. She wasn't dead, not even bloodied, but the impact knocked the wind from her, driving her to land roughly. I rolled back to my hooves as another sniper shot struck the ground right where my head had been. I needed to get out, get out from under the sniper pony. She was no calamity, but she was frighteningly good shot. And it would only take one hit. I ran for the nearest intact building, firing the last of my bullets into the two guard ponies standing watch in front of it. I tossed the rifle, telekinetically swooping up one of the guard's automatic pistols as a replacement, and burst through the front doors of the Alpha Omega Hotel. The hotel had once been hosted by the Summer Sun Celebration, and had seen better centuries. The aura of ruined ambiance clung to the interior, like its faded and peeling wallpaper. The air was dingy and filled with little motes of dust and decay. Small rain of plaster occasionally fell from the cracks in the ceiling. The hotel was home to ponies, who knew they were on a glorified death row. Ponies sat along a bar, drinking their night away, knowing that tomorrow most of them would be slaughtered in bloody spectacle for the amusement of the crowds. Crowds full of fellow slaves, who could somehow look into the pit and not see themselves. Who could look and actually cheer. My heart felt sick as I walked quickly through the small throng of silent slave ponies. They glanced my way briefly, if at all. They didn't care. Why should they? They were apparently incapable of caring about each other. I brushed dampness from my eyes and looked for the stairs. If I could make it to the roof, I could call Calamity and get the hell out of here. I made my way up to the Alpha Omega, who was plodding on rolled rotting carpet my EFS was picking up a host of friendly marks, but no sign of any pony, or griffin, who was hostile. I passed a painting of Celestia, standing gracefully in what looked like a grand ballroom, a kind smile on her face, surrounded by colorful ponies in a fever of a party. The summer sun celebration in full swing. The painting was graying from age and dust. Goddesses, this is a depressing place, I muttered almost wishing for more guards to come charging up behind me, if only so the adrenaline would shield me from the blanket of despair that was being beginning to smother me. Why weren't they? I should have Alstern's army on my tail by now. It's not like that sniper didn't see where I went. Maybe they considered me trapped? But even then, I couldn't imagine they wouldn't just sit back and let me take make my home in here. Why weren't they coming in? I found the next flight of stairs and started up, I was just clearing the top when all the friendly lights on my EFS turned red. I was picking up dozens of hostiles now. Far too many. The lights blurred together, making it impossible to identify the positions of individual opponents. I floated up the automatic pistol and crouched low, hoping I could sneak past most of them. The door opened. Not my horn, or not by horn or hoof but by telekinetic pole of a unicorn pony on the other side. I immediately slid into Sats, targeting the colt before he even saw me. I froze again. A colt. 
the child, who was floating a single shot shotgun next to him, inexpertly, wasn't even old enough to have a cutie mark. Beyond him, I saw other children, young fillies and colts, all looking well nourished, well cared for, and annoyingly well armed. The room itself was brightly lit and recently painted in cheery colors. The worst of the cracks had been repaired, I suspected by magic, and the air was considerably cleaner. Unlike every other building used by either slavers or slaves, this floor had been restored to a fair reflection of its former glory. My eyes widened further as I spotted what was clearly a schoolroom through the doorway opposite this one. Red Eye's words echoed through my head. Our nation's young ones are, and have been, my highest priority. All that we sacrifice, we do for them. We give them a better place. The scene before I, my eyes was simultaneously wonderful and horrifying. Young children, ripped from their homes, from other families, and given into the care of loving and approving mares and stallions. The real families were dying in the city below, trapped and enslaved behind the wall, while they themselves were given the best possible care, probably the best possible life in the equestrian wasteland. And they were being taught education, indoctrination. Of course they loved him. They would be ready to kill for him. Reddit was building schools, and he was about to have the ability to print his own textbooks. The scene was going to repeat, be repeated everywhere. I couldn't do it. I killed Sats. I couldn't sneak past all of them. And I couldn't, just couldn't, fight them. Hey! A colt called downstairs. She's up here! I turned to flee, only to see a midnight blue alicorn moving silently up the stairs towards me. I would have faced Hoof if I had given, been given the chance and had actually wondered why no one was coming in after me. By the goddesses, how could I have forgotten some of these monsters can turn invisible? The alicorn's horn was glowing. A metal apple floated towards me. The pin pulled. The alicorn would survive, but even if I did, the colt next to me would not. If there was time, I might have stopped to wonder why the alicorn would threaten a child if they were so clearly precious to Red Eye. But there was no time. Instinctively, I lashed out with my magic, trying to knock the grenade away. I realized my mistake as the world started to slip away from me. The last thing I saw in this world was the alicorn drop the illusion that surrounded the memory orb. They remembered. They learned. And I had been bested by my own trick. Everything shot into almost brutal sharpness. Colors were more colorful. The lines around objects almost vibrant. The sunlight was sunnier than I thought I ever imagined it could be. Bright and warm and glorious beyond belief. I could smell the bush I was standing behind, the flowers nearby, and the grass. I could smell the two ponies I was watching, and the sweat on Applejack would have made me stir in my recently wounded places, if I had been in my own body. It was not, however, a fact to which I was hyper aware. I could feel the slight burning on my left forehoof, as if I had recently touched a hot stove. I had an itch on my cheek, an odd pain in my hind legs that was barely noticeable, a tingle along my back. It was a familiar and delicious peppermint taste on my tongue. Oh, no. With dawning horror, I realized that my pony host was high on mentals. Oh, please no. I can't take this. The effects were nowhere near as pronounced, and I was getting the heightened perceptions, but none of the other effects. Still, it was too, uncom or too comfortable, too alluring. Howdy, Fluttershy, Applejack said, greeting her friend with a smile, as the yellow pegasus landed gently on the grass, as if worried about hurting it. 
Hello, Applejack, the Pegasus said meekly. So, what brings you to these parts? Well, the shy Pegasus looked down, crossing one leg over the other. I, uh, that is... Applejack rolled her eyes. Good gravy, girl. Spit it out already. Is something wrong? The Pegasus took a deep breath, and then said in a rush, Are you looking for a close mare friend? Because if you are, we could, um, you know. She paused, and all too obviously, having no clue what good mare friends did in the privacy of their own beds. My host stifled a giggle as Applejack's eyes went wide. Then she scowled, trotting past the deeply blushing Pegasus to slam her head repeatedly against a tree. When she finished, she turned on Fluttershy. All right, that's enough. What is it with all my friends hitting on me, pretending I'm a fiddly fuller? Y'all know better, and y'all are straight. She took a step forward. Fluttershy eeped and took a step back. Fluttershy, I know you, so be straight with me. The pun was probably not intended. Well, did Rainbow Dash put this up to you? Applejack demanded. Oh, Fluttershy squeaked, but shook her head. No. Applejack looked doubtful. So, you're saying y'all just thought this up on your lonesome? Fluttershy shook her head. So, Rainbow Dash did put you up to it. No, she insisted softly. My host began to move, silently creeping out from behind the bush. But some pony did, Applejack shushed out. Her yellow friend nodded. Who? My host had moved up behind Applejack so quickly and stealthily that I hadn't seen it, ha seen it happen. Still, it bewildered me how we could be standing this close and neither of the ponies seemed to notice us. Were we invisible? It certainly wouldn't be the first time I found myself in a magically hidden being who was spying on the Ministry Mares, but I was clearly an Earth Pony. Applejack turned around, only to find herself nose to nose with my host. Spooked, she jumped away so fast she toppled onto her back. Pinkie Pie! Hiya! I felt my muzzle say, hearing the words in a high-pitched but pretty voice. Ah, you caught me! What in tarnation are the blonde maned Pegasus or Orange Pony stomped, then face hoofed while still lying on her back in a most undignified position. You? This has all been one of your and Rainbow's practical jokes, ain't it? Yep, I heard myself say happily as I began to bounce. Bounce? Applejack pulled herself back under her hooves, staring at me and my host crossly. Care if I ask why? Well, you've been a total, uh, mopey pony since the funeral. Of course I have, Applejack shot. I buried my brother. And you've been working really, really hard, Pinkie Pie plowed on. And you haven't been getting out, or going to parties, or seeing your friends. And you haven't even talked to a buck in, like, forever. Applejack huffed. How would you know if I've... She stopped abruptly, realizing how stupid a question that was considering who she was asking. Fluttershy had slipped back a ways, almost hiding. And if you're all worked up and stressed and you're going to burn yourself out if you aren't careful and you really, really need to get laid... Applejack hung her head. Pinkie Pie was... incorrigible at best. This ain't gonna end until I get myself a buck friend, is it? Nope, Pinkie Pie announced bouncily. How the hell did she bounce on all hooves like that? I was inside her, and I still couldn't figure it out. Well, would it help if I say there is a buck I have my eye on? Pinkie Pie stopped, bouncing, and stared off into space. The itch on the side of her cheek migrated to her chin. She looked back to Applejack. Yep, that's the truth. My, but my itchy chin means you haven't told him yet. 
You gotta talk to him. Applejack sighed. And if I do, this nonsense stops. I watched the world rock as Pinkie Pie nodded enthusiastically. My host started chanting, Do it! Rumbleotically and rambunctiously as she bounced in circles around Applejack. Fine. Applejack reached out with a hoof and stopped Pinkie Pie. On one condition. What? Y'all gotta swear. Applejack turned to Fluttershy. Both of ya, the Rainbow Dash, don't hear a word of this. But, Pinkie Pie started. If Rainbow Dash doesn't know, how will she know it's time to stop the prank, silly? I can't deal with it from Rainbow. I mean, I can deal with it from Rainbow. Applejack said sternly. At least, now that I know where it's coming from, well, this possible buck friend of mine, well, he's kind of got a funny name. And I think Rainbow might not be able to keep herself from messing things up. Wow, that came out badly. Applejack seemed to realize it too. Look, I'll tell her myself when I'm ready. Not before. She looked at her two friends. Now y'all Pinkie Pie swear it. Pinkie Pie swear? My host's reaction was immediate. I struggled to keep track of the odd motions, which ended with sticking a hoof in my eye. That, accompanied by the sing-song that Pinkie Pie and Fluttershy managed to do it in perfect symphony. Cross my heart and hope to fly, stick a cupcake in my eye. Applejack brought a sigh of relief. The three friends began to walk, my host falling slowly behind. Oh, there it is again! Applejack and Fluttershy both stopped, looking back. There what is? Burning hoof means little pips watching me. Pinkie Pie blurted out impossibly. Or will be watching me. I'm not sure yet. She bounced after her friends. Who's little pip? The furnace pits? Stern suggested, glaring at me. I was bound and shackled to the floor. And, as if that was not enough, Two great uh, green-coated alicorns stood frozen beside me, trapping me inside a shield. Not only had I done most of the things that Stern considered a death sentence, I had done them with aggressive results. I had still failed, but she took the time to name each slaver I managed to kill before my <clears throat> inevitable capture. <clears throat> no, said Red Eye, eliciting a look of shock and displeasure from the griffin. The cybernetically augmented stallion walk up to face me. I'm feeling particularly generous today. I doubted I would care much for his definition of generosity, but the horrific tale of a pony being devoured from inside out by an ever-growing number of Paris sprites left me thankful of the same. Addressing me directly, Red Eye asked, Do you think I'm a monster? Bluntly, I answered, Yes. He shrugged, because of course, I am. And you, Stable Dweller, can probably see that more clearly than most, because you and I are a lot alike, are we not? Not even slightly, I hissed, lying through my teeth. Red Eye chuckled. I've heard of your exploits. I think we are more the same than you would like. You just had it easy so far. Enraged, I spat. Easy? You think I've had it, what I've been through out there has been easy? Red Eye gave me an almost fatherly smile. The fact that you can still stand there and judge me tells me so. You have had hardships, I'm sure, but you've never been forced to give up on your principles for the greater good. To sacrifice yourself and become a monster because it was the right thing to do. Oh, how I disagreed. You couldn't do it even to escape he noted. For which, by the way, I'm very grateful. Had you harmed a hair on even one of those children? He paused, then simply added, Thank you. Red Eye turned toward Stern. His cape fell into view. A rough rectangle made from stable utility barding. The number 101 was visible in yellow against the black cloth. 
Take her back downstairs and keep her under shield. Tomorrow, she fights in the pit. Lined up in the darkness with five other ponies, I spent an hour rummaging through the recordings of Miss Periwinkle. Most were worthless, but one was actually from a ministry mayor, and not the one I had been expecting. Dear Miss Periwinkle, the voice began, I found it very odd to hear an audio message addressed like it was a letter. It was a pleasure to hear from you again. The new posters for the libraries are absolutely perfect. I hope it will not be a burden to have 200 produced by next week. I also have a more delicate matter to ask you about. Let me preface this by saying that for decades now, ever since she taught me about her gem finding spell, Rary and I have gotten together at irregular intervals to swap magical spells. I must admit, and please believe I do not say this to brag, it has been a long time since she brought anything that I had not already learned myself. That is, until three days ago. I was thrilled to see that she had learned a trick I had never seen before. She had enchanted a small mirror. To look in it, you would see your reflection, just as with any mirror. But if you touched it, or focused your magic on it, then the spell within the mirror took, well, the way she put it, the mirror took a picture of your soul. Then a second enchantment allowed the mirror to show you that image. As Rarity told me, the mirror could show you what you would look like on the outside, or on the inside. I must admit, I wasn't really ready for what I saw. And I'm still not sure about it, but that's personal. Rather, I wanted to ask you if you could give me any clues as to where Rarity may have learned enchantments like that. I know Rarity would refashion any magical spell until it was customized to her wishes, but honestly, I've been scouring my books and I've found nothing that would even remotely resemble these spells. I know you have worked closely with her for the last few months, so I hoped you would have an idea. Also. It's hardly worth mentioning, but the spell felt... cold. Not like rarity spells at all. Anyway, this is mostly just a matter of rampant curiosity, and I ask you that you please not mention it to, the, to her. But if you have any idea, I'd really appreciate it if you let me know. Your friend, Twilight Sparkle. I deleted the messages from my pit buck, but kept that one. I sat in silent darkness, with five other marked souls, as I waited. The noise outside told me that the seating around the arena was quickly filling. I heard Stern, her voice magnified over speakers, welcoming every pony to the bloody show. I heard hooves pounding bleachers in applause. My face twisted in disgust. How could they? This was sick. Earlier, a slave pony a slave master pony, had attached a sheet to my flank, covering my cutie mark. She had snarled and whispered at me, her fondest desires that my suffering be deep and excruciating, and very slow. She had known one of the rapist slavers. The only reason I survived being numbered was because Stern was watching, and she still got away with covering the bottom side of the sheet with some sort of stinging powder that was making it hard for me to concentrate. I was number three. Blood and Daff were numbers two, uh, one and two, respectively. They sat closest to the gate, looking out at the arena. A large plot of broken cement underneath a cage from which several barrels were suspended. I could see pressure plates set up like mines all over them. Neither of them had spoken to me, and going out of their way to ignore my existence. I couldn't decide whether to be hurt or relieved. It used to be an ice skating rink, the, the blue-colored buck with number four on his flank said conversationally. Apparently, the owner of Fun Farm had a thing for ice skating. Just be thankful that Red Eye removed the water talisman and put it to better use. These fights are brutal enough without having to do them on ice. I tried to imagine 
that and just couldn't. Outside, the crowds began to chant for the first fight. Their hoof stomps falling into a unity that would make the goddess proud. Part of me wanted to hurt them. And these were the ponies I was trying to save. Hey, consider yourself lucky, the blue buck jolted. Being number three ain't bad. Has any pony told you how these things work? I shook my head. The roar outside rose into a crescendo. There was a loud buzz, then a clang sound as the gate was levitated up by a unicorn no pony inside could see. Round one, Stern's voice boomed. From the Red Gate, all the way from the Rock Farms, we have Cinderblock. This is his first event, so you know he's got some hooves on him. And from the Black Gate, she's tough, she's mean, she's a raider with a body count higher than the spikes in her hair, it's Blood. <clears throat> blood got up, looking dejectedly at the open gate for a moment, then held her held up and trotted out, putting on a brave face that I didn't believe even for one bit. You see, number four was telling me, there are two gates. We're Black Gate, and each gate has six fighters, randomly numbered. If you survive your first round, you'll be pitted against the next opponent from the Red Gate. The event lasts until all opponents from one gate are dead. The survivors from the other gate live to fight in the next event. I looked at Blood and winced. So basically, it sucks to be number one. I couldn't believe I was feeling sympathy for the Vile Raider Mare. Well, it's a give and take, number four said. I looked at him quizzically. I mean, true, if you're a high enough number, it's possible you won't have to fight at all. And any pony who survives six events is set free. Doesn't matter if he actually fought or not. I got the feeling that number four they made it through at least one event, just that way. You even get a spot in Red Eye's army, he said enthusiastically. I considered pointing out to him that the sort of positions Red Eye would likely appoint him to if he never won a fight, but I kept my muzzle shut. The sudden roar of the crowd snapped my attention back to the arena. Blood was down, soaking in a pool of her own, well, blood. Cinderblock. An athletic-looking, light gray buck was rearing his hooves in victory. The fight had lasted seconds. The heart, my heart sank. What was the benefit of being first again? I asked dully. Number four leaned close, apparently unable to comprehend personal space. Well, you see those barrels, and you see those plates? I nodded to each. Step on a plate, the barrel above drops. Now, the barrels are full of nasty stuff, usually radioactive goo, but sometimes something worse. I heard they once had filled one with, with tainted ooze. I shuddered, looking up at the cage that had been constructed over the arena and had barrels hanging from it. A few, a few griffins flew high above, watching the show with binoculars or through rifle scopes. My head caught a swinging door built into the cage kept closed by a single padlock. Round two, Stern cried out. From the Black Gate, we have Daffodil. The crowd bloke down into snickers and laughs as Daff got up and pulled out into the arena. He took one look at the bloody corpse of a companion and then looked Cinderblock with a hard stare that I could almost feel from behind. Daffodil charged at the light gray pony Cinderblock ran, not towards him, but towards one of the pressure plates. The barrel above didn't exactly drop. Rather, as the gray pony raced across the plate, the underside of the barrel swung open, and a dozen mines rained down, hitting the ground and bouncing in all directions. Daff changed directions with a deftness I would not have expected. The mines were rigged for fast detonation, only beeping once then exploding into a flash of smoke and shrapnel. Cinderblock had been fast enough, but his hind legs were peppered and torn as he was flung forward. He was still struggling to get back on his bleeding legs when Daff reached him. I knew how hard those hooves hit, but seeing this, 
I suspected that Daff had held back when he bucked the living fuck out of me. Even with his last, low blow. The crowd beat their hooves and cried out more as Daff pummeled the other buck, breaking his legs first, then every other bone he could before he killed him. I tasted bile. Mines, number four mused. Well, that's a new one. I shot him a dark look. Hey, like I was saying, those barrels have nasty things. But they also always have a weapon or two in them. So if you're first, you get your pick of the prizes. And if you go last, well, you go up, a weapon, uh, go up against an opponent who has their choice of weapons. In an arena filled with ooze and goddess knows what else. And all you have are your hooves. Fighting last sucks. Round three, Stern finally announced after Daff had stopped brutalizing Cinderblock and started to just beat a dead pony. From the Black Gate, we still have Daffodil after a surprisingly and entertaining first performance. I don't think any of you ponies were snickering at his name now, are you? The crowd applauded the crimson splattered buck, whose angry flower, cutie mark, was now partially visible behind his number two patch which was sagging and wet with Cinderblock's lifeblood. And now, the one you've all been waiting for. The crowd hushed with gleeful anticipation. From the Red Gate, she's demonic, she's exotic, and she has never lost a fight. Give it up for our champion, four events running, Zenith. My first thought struck my brain at the word exotic was a Pegasus Mare. The idea of facing a flying opponent's arena was terrifying, and if she was as good as advertised, I would be facing her as soon as she killed Daff. Redgate opened, and Zenith stepped out into the arena, to absolutely thunderous, overwhelming applause. From her grim expression, she wasn't enjoying it one bit. From the look she gave Daff, she was going to kill him. She knew it, and it brought her no pleasure at all. From her lack of wings, she wasn't a pegasus. From her stripes, she wasn't even a pony. She's a zebra. Footnote. Level up. New perk. Cooler under fire. You regenerate action points faster. How much faster? You guessed it. 20% faster. <laughs> 